Harmon Street Arts in downtown Waterville. Thrilled to see such a great crowd. Um, my name is Rainy Mize. I'm on the exhibitions committee here at the gallery. Um, and I am so excited for this exhibition, Underlying Threads. Um, and when we were thinking about possible programs for this show, we understand that the mills here in Maine, textile mills and otherwise, have extremely personal connections for a lot of us. Um, so we wanted to give the community the opportunity to discuss what mills might have meant to them or their family um, or what they mean to them today and to start that conversation in a historical context. So we have invited Earl G. Shuttleworth, Jr., the Main State Historian, and Lydia Bischoff, the Associate <laughs> Professor of History at USM, um, to sort of help us, help orient us um, in that context. Um, but just a few housekeeping um, notes before we get started with the presentation. Um, it's going to be a very vibrant evening. We've got a lot of sort of moving parts, uh, so please feel free to stay for as much or as little as you'd like. Um, we'll begin with their presentation um, on the textile history of photography in Maine. Uh, then we will hear from two of our artists um, who Lisa will introduce um, after the presentation who will describe a bit of their work that you can see here. Um, all of the work here is for sale, so keep that in mind if anything strikes you. We have booklets in the back that will tell you more about that. Our restrooms are here to the left. Well, one restroom, I shouldn't say plural, but <laughs> right there. Um, we have receptions here at the back that are free. Please help yourself throughout. Um, and after the artists speak, we'll take a brief break, um, a brief recess, and we will. there's the opportunity for you to write your memories or thoughts about Mills in Maine. Um, we have post-it notes in the back, and we would love for you to decorate the wall around the title wall with those thoughts, um, should you care to. Um, and then we'll reconvene, and we'll sort of have an open forum that I'll help moderate um, with people asking questions of Earl or Libby, um, sharing stories, um, and the like. So, um, Lisa, did I forget anything? I think that's it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, without further ado, Earl Sowers and Libby Bischoff. Thank you. Well, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to uh, be back in Waterville. Um, uh, some of you may know I'm, I'm very familiar with Waterville. Um, growing up summers in Skowhegan, although I was originally from Portland, uh, we would come down each week during the 1950s and 60s to shop in Waterville. Uh, and my mother had gone to Colby. She was class of 1927. Uh, she would meet some of her old professors on the street. And so I actually met professors that were teaching at Colby a hundred years ago, right at this time, <laughs> which makes me feel perfectly ancient. Um, uh, and then I went to Colby myself and uh, graduated in 1970. Uh, and more recently uh, was involved in doing a little uh, postcard history uh, of the city. But tonight, uh, Libby and I are going to focus on a sort of broad brush approach uh, to the history of the textile industry in Maine. Just a little bit of broader background, the textile industry as it relates to New England uh, begins in England uh, in the mid to late 18th century. This is the first major mechanization of uh, manufacturing in the what we call the Industrial Revolution. And in the 1790s, a very enterprising young man named Samuel Slater uh, visits the mills in England. Uh, it was absolutely against the law to uh, import uh, any of the designs for the textile manufacturing uh, equipment out of England. But Slater memorized uh, the designs. And then when he got back on shipboard, he wrote them down uh, and uh, went back to, uh, to the Providence area and actually began the construction of the first mill around 1794. Uh, although there was a major concentration in the earliest days around Rhode Island, and it continued, uh, the textile industry really followed where the water power was. And the first great water power to be exploited uh, was in Lowell, and then from Lowell to Lawrence. Those were the two great manufacturing centers for textile in uh, Massachusetts. But those quickly were outgrown, and the, the Boston capitalists, uh, the, the Lawrences, uh, the Lowells, the Cabots, uh, who were making vast fortunes out of this manufacturing, decided they needed to go north. And they first went uh, to Manchester uh, in uh, New Hampshire, where there was water on the Amiskeg. And earlier on, interests had already started uh, in Biddeford, Saco, uh, moving on to Lewiston, uh, to Augusta, 
and finally to Waterville. Waterville was actually the last of the major mill sites to be exploited uh, in northern New England. We'll get into that in a little bit. But that just gives you a very quick overview of that 100 years of bridge from starting in England and ending in Waterville uh, right after the Civil War. Uh, our first view is called The Heart of Biddeford and Saco. It's a 1941 postcard. And it celebrates the fact that by the early 20th century, there was this extraordinary concentration of um, huge brick mill structures, all from the textile industry, primarily <coughs> cotton, but some flannel and some wool as well. And these were started on Factory Island on the Saco River as early as 1829 by the York Manufacturing Company, which, like the other sites in New England, were financed by these Boston capitalists. Next, please. And here is another view. Now we're right along the, 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 the Saco River. We're getting deep into the heart of the mill district on either side of the river. Uh, Biddeford on the, on the left, Sanko on the right. This is a view from the time of World War I in 1917. And these mills would have been going round the clock in World War I to uh, produce uh, textile uh, for the war effort. Next, please. Uh, here's a, a view from the uh, City Hall Tower in Biddeford, looking down on this extraordinary uh, complex of buildings in the foreground of the mills in Biddeford, but in the background of the mills in Saco. And we're looking in particular at Pepperell Mill Number 3, which was one of the largest and is still uh, very much standing and is now actually going under various adaptive reuse schemes. Um, manufacturing by the Pepperell Company began in 1850, and by 1860, they had three mills. As I say, this was mill number three, employing 450 men and 1,200 women. Next, please. And this is a wonderful view uh, from the turn of the century, uh, showing, uh, this is called at 12.03 noon. And this is the work where everyone's pouring out of the, the base of the mill tower uh, to take their, uh, their lunch break. Uh, at, from Pepperell Mill number three. Next, please. And here's another wonderful view called the Noon Hour at the Pepperell Manufacturing Company, circa 1910. And uh, these are all the mill workers, many of them women, um, and as you can see, very, very nicely dressed. Um, in the background at the right uh, is the old office building, which is still standing, and then the Pepperell number three mill is at the left. Uh, we saw that in the last couple of views. Now, the whole issue of establishing these mill <coughs> complexes uh, was very much a system of paternalism, at least in the first generation or two, of uh, the investment in these communities. Not only would uh, mills be built, but also it was necessary to create the hydraulics to run the mills, whether it was dams or canals or a combination of both. So these were huge uh, engineering as well as uh, architectural feats to create uh, these manufacturing complexes. And then, of course, you had to attract a workforce. And this was a pattern that uh, first started in Lowell and then was replicated elsewhere, where the companies, in this case uh, the Pepple Company, would build a large mill block, oftentimes several mill blocks. Um, and there, uh, the, particularly the young single men and single women uh, would uh, rent from the company for a modest amount uh, a, a house, a, a, a housing to live in, usually, usually just a room. And these were literally called boarding houses. And they were a very important factor, particularly in the earlier generations of mill development. This is the Pepperell Block uh, built on Pearl Street in 1850, 420 feet in length. It housed uh, 256 rooms, and it stood till about 1910. Look at that. Next, please. So within these, um, the built environment and the, the changing landscape of Maine in this era of mills, I think, you have to think of the history in a variety of ways. For me, I mean, I teach the history of Maine. I'm a Maine historian. Um, the history of Maine, in many ways, is the history of labor and work. I think the culture of work and the strong work ethic of Mainers and the dedication to this kind of labor is really what 
defines and, and shapes the history of the state in so many ways. And so you see the way with the postcards that Earl has brought in and the built environment of Maine is changing so much, a lot of from this outside capital investment. The Boston Associates, um, who are providing a lot of this capital, it's interesting when they first um, start the mills in, in Lowell and Waltham, and uh, they partially do it as a response to Jefferson's embargo of 1807, because it stops a lot of the shipping trade where they had made a lot of their money. And so if there was going to be an embargo or there were going to be political interferences, then they thought they'd best invest their money elsewhere that wouldn't be necessarily as affected um, by that kind of an embargo. So that was one of the reasons they switched over to the manufacturing. And when in Lowell, they decided to experiment with um, having women populate the workforce of the mills. And most of the women that they recruited, and it was an active recruiting both in Lowell and New Hampshire and in Biddeford and Saco and, and all the way up, uh, were from farm girls of New England. And your time at the mill, at least in the 19th century, was seen as almost an in-between time between where you would leave your parents' home and before you would have a home of your own and get married. Um, and a lot of the families were reluctant to send their young daughters um, into a growing city environment. There was a lot of change brought on um, by the mills coming to what had once been. I mean, Lowell was a town of 200 people prior to the building of the Lowell Mills. I mean, it exploded in, the, in, the, in 10 to 15 years. Um, the population just exponentially grows with the mill. So there's a fear of sending these women into the city. And you can see them here. They're very well dressed. Um, and there were a lot of social results to this. Um, so they had to convince the families that their daughters would be safe, hence why they would live in the boarding house. Uh, there were very strict conduct rules that the women had to sign when you were in, when you were out, who was supervising or accompanying or overseeing any visitors, when visitors were allowed. You did have to, for a while, especially in the 19th century, uh, attend church on Sunday um, as part of the contractual working at the mills um, to look over your moral and spiritual well-being. But despite the, the tight structure of the rules, not only it's a massive change for people. You live by the farm, you live by the seasons, you live by sunrise and sunset, and now you're living by the clock and the punch card and the bell. So you have to adjust to that way of life. But also this freedom and earning money. And the women take these opportunities to earn their own money, to buy many of their own clothes, especially some of the fancier items that you see here. Um, that they would buy jewelry or special hats or shawls or, or things to make and they would get freedom that way. But you also see many women going to the mills to earn money. There was more than one girl who went to the mill to earn the tuition to put her brother through Harvard. Right? That the women were, there are many stories like this from Massachusetts where the women are going to the mill and sending home the money which pays the tuition for the boys of the family. But in a lot of places, in Maine and in Massachusetts, there was also an opportunity for these women to get a pretty solid education. Uh, there were lecture series that were very widely attended that women would go to. Um, in Lowell and elsewhere, they had their own mill literary magazines and newspapers that were written and edited by the operatives themselves. And so these women banded together and gained this sense of independence that I don't think the paternal mill owners were always expecting. And sometimes that resulted in strikes starting in the 1830s in Lowell with the women banding together for, for different hours. So these pictures show us kind of a very, I love the pose yeah. here at the top, very <laughs> self-assured women who, many of whom for the first time are, are earning a wage. Now it's half the wage that a man in their position would have been earning. But nonetheless, it's the great Lowell experiment, but it's also a way to make a lot more money. If you're employing women and you're paying them half the wage that you would have paid men, then you're Yes, they're getting opportunities to work and to do these things and to have this in-between time before, between the farm and marriage, but you're also making a pretty hefty profit off their labor, which you, which you keep going. So we have a lot of the uh, pictures of women um, 
posing together. And in many of them, you'll also see the tools of their trades. So they both act as a kind of self-assertion, but also as um, an occupational portrait, which were very common during that time, and sort of how you might identify yourself in that. And just a note on this particular photograph, it was taken about 1890 in Biddeford of uh, four uh, women mill workers by a local photographer named N.P. Renault. Uh, and ethnically, the, as, as uh, uh, Libby has said, the first generation uh, coming into these mills in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s are uh, young women uh, who would be coming would be coming from the farms and they would be coming from the traditional New England background of English and, and Scotch descent. Uh, by the time of the Civil War, you begin to have some Irish women involved. And then after the Civil War, a large influent, uh, influx of uh, people from Canada. So it, it's a very interesting uh, change that occurs through the generations of the mills in the 19th century. Next, please. And I just added another view of um, the boarding houses as well, and this one is stereo view from Biddeford, Maine, from the collection of the Mark MacArthur Public Library. Um, just in the sense that these sorts of views were being produced, which is, I think, very interesting about, obviously, Earl at Maine for Preservation collects, has a collection of thousands of views of the built environment in Maine. And I think that people were it's not the main vacation view that people are necessarily expecting to find on a postcard. And yet, hundreds, and you probably have thousands of postcards in your collection that feature mills in this kind of the built environment. And so this stereograph, which you would have put in the viewer and seen it in 3D, also kind of belies an interest in the working life of Maine. Um, and again, this is where these women uh, would have stayed. As the mills expanded, uh, and grew the need for more storage. And as um, more workers came down from Canada and elsewhere, uh, the, there wasn't that much of a need for boarding houses when you weren't always dealing with single women and single men at a certain stage of their life, when you're more employing families and things like that. So this boarding house was actually destroyed to make a warehouse for the cotton itself. So I think after you kind of go through that initial part of the New England farm girls and then the early stages of immigration, you don't need the boarding houses as much. The character of the, of the mill really changes. Next, please. And I just added um, these photographs and yeah, the postcards to some extent too. I just wanted to make the note that the, the work in the mills is, especially early on, very gendered. So these are overseers and managers. And you will know, I mean, that's what it is for the, from the Pepperell uh, Manufacturing Company. So these are overseers and managers, and they are all men. Um, and it would have been very common, even from you know, Earl's statistic of 400 men, 1,200 women working in a mill, that the women would have been, they tend to have worked the machines on the floor where the men would have been the floor supervisors overseeing the women and, and walking through, um, and also, with the mill comes a whole layer of bureaucracy and the need for data in people's lives. You really see this grow in the 19th century where they're tracking production and output and how many yards of cloth are produced in a day and who's producing what and where that's going. Um, and so you need bean counters to sort of keep track of all of those things too. So it also creates not only a lot of labor jobs in the mill, but also a lot of the white collar jobs that go along with it. And you see these men grouped here. Thanks, please. And these next two views, uh, these are our last two views of Pitifit as we now about to move on to Lewiston. These are interior uh, real photo postcards taken about 1910 of the interior of uh, one of the, um, uh, really the packing rooms uh, in the Laconia Mill in Biddeford. Uh, the, the cloth is flanneled, and as you can see, um, it's a combination of men and boys. And uh, Libby can address better than I can the whole issue of child labor in the mills, along with women, children as well. Uh, but here we see it quite graphically in the very center of this postcard from 1910. Uh, a little boy, very nicely dressed, and then immediately to the right, um, the, the, the two older men. If we can go to the next one. Um, here again, this is in the flannel packing room uh, of the Laconia Mill. In this case, um, all of the, uh, the operatives are, are, are men here as opposed to boys. 
And what is so striking, I think, about these images and the others is that how clearly it's so careful to preserve the whiteness of the flannel, which stands out really here. They're in very clean white aprons and everything else as well. Earl, do you know where they where most of the flannel was exported or who was buying no, it? I, I, I don't think about it. Yeah, the only way we know it's flannel is that in the shop that we had before, uh, a moment ago, it actually, the packing, it's already been, been packed um, and, and it says a Laconia flannel right on it. Yeah. And Maine's textiles are, and people kind of forget this about Maine history and think about the North, Maine's textiles are very tied uh, before the Civil War to Southern cotton. Um, so there's a very strong tie between um, shipping a lot of the cotton from the South, um, slave-picked cotton comes up and it is woven through these textile mills here and elsewhere. Well, I just wanted to point out that these columns are mimicking the columns that you see in these photos. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's what I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, even the shade. Yeah. 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 Those are the columns. Mm -hmm. So now we, now we go to Lewiston. And Lewiston, uh, of all of the communities, this is the one that, that literally uh, rises overnight. Uh, Libby was mentioning about uh, one of the mill communities uh, in uh, uh, in Massachusetts that at one at one moment has 200 people and then has thousands. Lewiston became by the Civil War the seventh largest textile manufacturing center in New England. Right? Again, it was this Boston capital. In 1850, the Franklin Company, which was the overview development company for uh, Lewiston as a mill community, sent a man named Albert Hannibal Kelsey, who was an engineer and a builder. And he designed the entire system of having, a, to, to the right of this photograph, would be the Androscoggin River and the great Androscoggin Falls, which are the source of the power. And then the, the falls are diverted um, to the canals. And in between the, the, the river and the canals is a great line of mills. And then over to the left are the boarding houses. And beyond is the common with the churches and the public buildings. So it literally was a planned community that rose out of nothing. Lewiston was, again, a, a village of a few hundred people before this happened. But by the time of the Civil War, uh, it was this huge uh, planned uh, community. This is a view taken about 1910, when the whole system had matured, was still very, very active at this textile industry. But you can see that the beautiful elms now have grown to maturity. Uh, and this is the, 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 the wonderful sort of tension and dichotomy of these communities. Um, it's that, that, that famous uh, book title, uh, The Machine in the Garden, really, uh, in which uh, these planned communities are, are created uh, both architecturally, the buildings and the settings for them. Uh, they, they're really model communities that are quite beautiful in and of themselves, but of course they mask um, the, the, the difficulties and the challenges uh, of manual labor. Next, please. And here's another view, again from 1910, of the, the heart of uh, the Lewiston district. In, in beyond, uh, in the upper uh, center, you have the hill mills, and in the foreground, the Bates mills. And then right across the canal to the left, very similar to Biddeford, this huge string of, um, of boarding houses that would house hundreds of people, hundreds of operatives. Next, please. And this is another view. Now we're looking up toward the Lewiston Falls. The hill mills are at the left. Uh, the Bates mills are beyond um, the canal in the, in the foreground. Next, please. And the, the mill development in Lewiston uh, just thrived. Uh, after the initial development between 1850 and 1860, uh, a, a series of additional structures were built during and after the Civil War. One of the greatest was the Continental Mill, built about 1870. Now, of course, by the 1950s and 60s, these were all winding down. But they are to a, to almost entirely still with us today, and they're now gradually being readapted. Next, please. And now we get into a series of, of fascinating uh, stereoptican views that were taken by Henry, Henry LaRock, who was a Franco-American photographer who was working in Lewiston in the 1880s to the 1920s. 
we know that he probably took these views about 1883. And they are rare because, for the most part, when the interiors of the mills were taken in the 1870s and 80s by photographers, they would be devoid of the laborers. But here, being a Franco-American, having an, an empathy and a connection with the workers themselves, he actually includes the workers. And these are the among, among the most powerful and telling images of uh, mill workers uh, in Maine. Libby, do you want to comment on these quickly? We'll go three of the other um, four of them. There are these, and I think they pair nicely with the, the Lewis Hine images that will come after. I think it's so important because you, when you see the postcards, and, and Earl talked very well about the planned community aspect of it, those almost would act as advertisements for the people who own the mill. Look what we built. Look what we've created. Look how clean and ordered this is. But a mill doesn't operate in this era without people. I mean, labor is what makes this possible. The people who are working in the mill is what make this possible and what give the, what bring community to this and kind of showcase that. And, and the other photographs that really showcase the machines and the architecture and the planning are nice, but they don't give the heart and soul of the mill and these communities themselves, which are the people who populate it and really make it possible. And that's really showcased in, in this work. And we wonder, too, and, and we don't know, um, the circumstances upon which he would come into a mill and, and take photographs, whether it was at the behest of the workers or the owners, which is sometimes interesting to think about, too, um, because they are his uh, rocks views are very different. Um, they're not as formal, and they really do emphasize the labor and the dignity of labor. And um, you get, also get a sense of scale, too, when the people are in there. Which I think and, is important. And, and it's a combination of men, women, and children. Mm -hmm. By this point, yeah. Uh, we'll go through these real quick. This is the spinning room at the Continental Mill. The next one is the weave room at the Continental Mill. And then we have the spool room at the Continental Mill. Next, please. And this is, again, um, the spool room. So these are all around 1883, and they're, they're part of a larger series that Maroc made, and they're, they're really almost unique as far as stereo views are concerned. Next, please. And here is just a nice labor force view. Uh, there was a section of the mill complex in Lewiston called the bleachery, uh, where the cloth would be processed. And this is a view from around 1900. And again, if you look closely, there's a whole row of children in the foreground, and then the younger men, and then the older workers, and then the women are up there on the, on the, uh, on the bridge. <laughs> Maybe that was a matriarchal <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting about this, and then it goes into the, the Lewis Hine photos, which I'll talk about in a second, is, is we sometimes think about child labor as hidden, or something that people may have been ashamed of. Um, and that wasn't necessarily the case at the time. And a lot of... Um, the child, I think it's very different now when we hear the tragedies of mills in Bangladesh and fires and um, sweatshop labor and the fact that so much of this work has been um, exported elsewhere and is in some way hidden from view. I think when you had these mills here and you saw them and you were working in them and you knew the people, you knew where your clothing came from, you knew the people who made it, you made it. There was pride in that making. I think there's a large disconnect in the 21st century between so I think this is such a nice meditation on that, is this reconnection between cloth and community and, and people and memory is kind of woven into these pieces in the way that these are the people who worked in the mill. We're not hiding the kids. They're front and center. They worked there too. Their parents may have as well. Their older brothers and sisters may have worked there as well. The laws were not in place, but there were one of the reasons why small children are employed, particularly in textile mills. Um, you see them. You don't see them as much in paper mills and elsewhere, but because they have small hands and there were various moving parts and some of them are doffers and some of them are threaders, some of them can thread things with very small hands that others can't. Others can go underneath machines and pick up scraps um, and run back and forth. And it's not, much of the work is, is very dangerous and, and you start to see this in the early 20th century. So the next couple um, are by a very famous, um, social photographer named Lewis Hine, and actually I was so pleased because there's um, 
a lovely Lewis Hine sort of 3D cutout piece behind there, and I saw him elsewhere too. And Hine is an interesting character. Um, he sort of was an educator at the Ethical Culture School in um, New York City, he was actually Paul Strand's teacher. Um, but he came into his own uh, with photography and social work, and he's employed by the National Child Labor Commission for um, more than a decade. And the National Child Labor Commission gets its start in 1904, and they have a credo and a sort of a mission that work, there is dignified work, they believe in the dignity of labor, they believe in work, but they believe in education. And so they're all about breaking the cycle of child labor to educate the child so they can better themselves and families aren't caught in this cycle. There's a paternalism about that. There's very much a middle class, progressive era value system about that. That's not necessarily shared when the whole family has to work if the whole family wants to eat. Um, but Hein traveled around the country, including twice in Maine. And he came to Maine in April of 1909, and then he came later on to Eastport. So his first trip to Maine focused on the textile mills um, in Lewiston and Sanford, and then uh, the sardine canneries in Eastport. He has a much larger series of later. But his views in Lewiston, uh, he was here for a couple of weeks, Hein often took pictures inside of mills and people working inside of mills, but he couldn't always get in, even by trickery. Sometimes he would pose as an insurance agent, sometimes he would say he was from somewhere else. He would go in with his camera and try to get it. But in 1909, he gave a, a big speech to a group of social workers, which is a growing profession at this time, and said, um, the greatest tool that this new profession can use is the camera that social workers must be trained to also be social photographers. That let there be light, what better way to illustrate to the people the ills that you're trying to reckon with and mediate than actually showing people. So he's an interesting photographer, he's a very talented photographer and, and works on labor even when he's not doing child labor and uh, immigration at Ellis Island. But he also captions like a, like a sociologist or a social worker. So even when he can't get inside the mill, as he really couldn't in Lewiston, they're only exteriors, he will note the time of the day, you know, 6 a.m., 6.30 p.m., I saw them inside. So it's always a kind of implication and proof because the Child Labor Commission would take these and they would turn them into traveling exhibitions. Um, and when they would display them all over the country. And it wasn't like these communities didn't know that child labor was sometimes problematic in the mills. There's a series of newspaper articles from Lewiston right around the time before and after um, Hein visited that essentially say, um, you know, young boy, 11, fell in the mill today while working, skull fracture, we don't know if he'll make it. Um, there were other child labor activists who had visited Lewiston during this time and spoken out about it, but Hein was talking about um, child labor nationally and trying to get national laws passed, which his photographs were effective in, but those child labor laws don't come in until about 15, 20 years later. So his is kind of exposing it. So you see this one, um, and he kind of showed there you, this one is I saw them working inside, and then the next one, <coughs> This is one of my favorites um, because of the woman who stares back at us and at Hein. And I always think of her as a sort of don't you dare pass judgment, right, on why we're here or who's coming in or, or the, the dignity of this or why my child is, is with me. There's a healthy skepticism there. Uh, sometimes people would pose for him, sometimes they wouldn't. Um, sometimes he had a harder time getting girls at the mills to pose for him. But boys, on the other hand, if you can see in the next one, we're often not shown to be his pictures. Um, and in this one, he's really, um, you know, he's sort of smoking, and you, you get the point, right? So Heinz trying to get you to emotionally react to these, to feel for the children, to ask questions about why they're there, when they're there, what they're doing, and how this benefits them, usually to the point of they should be in school instead. With the Lewiston photos, Hyde often captions them, and they couldn't even speak English, which is sort of a misjudgment, because perhaps some of them couldn't, but that's because the language of home, and even school to some extent for a certain period of time, was French. 
because of where they came from. So it's not that they weren't capable of learning English, but he's sort of using that as they haven't even been to school, they can't even speak English. And he said, you know, these two had combined been at the mills more than eight years. And so he's really trying to get people to do the visual math. And these photos are very effective for the NCLC, but I always find it really interesting that Maine was one of the stops, and then he kept these in large albums, and he compares Maine's mills to the southern textile mills and says the child labor issues here are just as bad as they are there. So it's kind of a national campaign for him. Next, please. Uh, here we have a nice group photo uh, in Lewiston in front of the uh, one of the boarding houses. Just gives you a feeling of, of people in these boarding houses as opposed to the shots we've had from Bitterford where they're just the buildings themselves. Uh, next, please. Uh, and then this is a lovely photo postcard uh, taken by Henry, Henry LaRock at the very end of his life. He died about 1925. This was taken in 1923. And it is of a Mill family uh, living in the, uh, on, at 20 Canal Street in the Hill Mill Block in Lewiston. Um, and you know, everybody is just absolutely um, sweet, clean, all dressed up. Uh, and uh, probably, uh, probably they've been to, uh, they're in their Sunday best. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, now we move to Waterville, uh, and uh, this is actually a very early, one of the early photographs of Waterville. Uh, Waterville was very fortunate uh, to have a very gifted uh, photographer in the earliest period, a man named Simon Wing, who worked here from about 1849 until about 1860, when he then went on to Boston. He actually, later in life, um, ran for president on the socialist ticket. He's, he's the only photographer we know who ran for president. He got 70,000 votes. Uh, in any case, he's a very gifted photographer in Maine in the 1850s. And this is one frame of a stereo view that he took about 1860 called Crummett's Mill. And that we're actually on the, uh, we're actually on the, um, uh, the Kenbeck River. Uh, and we'll see this building in a few moments in some of the later stereo views. But I put it in here because this is the kind of industrialization that existed prior to the big outside investment projects uh, on the main rivers. Just these simple late 18th, early 19th century mills that they might have been grist mills, they might have been sawmills, they might have been small furniture manufactories or whatever that were using water power. But this was, this was industrialization uh, in the first generation. Next, please. And then uh, uh, Waterville, right after the Civil War, becomes the last uh, great center of mill construction. Uh, and this is, um, uh, again, Boston uh, investors. And they hire Amos D. Lockwood, uh, who is one of the leading mill architects and engineers uh, in the Northeast. He worked in Lewiston uh, to design uh, a, a, a complex of mills that's built in two uh, campaigns. And we're looking here um, uh, from across uh, the Kennebec River. Uh, we're looking from, uh, from Winslow. There's the old uh, covered bridge. And just to the right of the bridge is that Crummett's Mill. Um, and then looming up behind these, these artifacts from Waterville's earlier time is this beautifully designed, uh, massive uh, brick structure built between 1874 and 1875. And it, could, uh, it had uh, housed uh, 55,000 spindles in the machinery. Next, please. And this is a series of photographs taken by the local photographer uh, Charles G. Carlton uh, when uh, the first of the, uh, uh, the Lockwood Mills was completed uh, in 1875. Now we have, we're looking from the river, but we have a close up here uh, the mill and the big L constructed uh, to the right as well. Next, please. Uh, now we're at a different angle. We're, we're further along uh, the river, down the river, uh, on the Winslow side. And we can see uh, the facade of the mill, which is perpendicular to, um, to the river, uh, with a big tower with a little crest on the top, water bill to the right in the background. Next, please. And uh, then we, we have this uh, slightly later view um, taken by S.S. Boson's son. Uh, when the second of the Lockwood Mills is built in 1881-82, uh, and this added an additional capacity of 33,000 spindles. Next, please. 
And here are the two buildings together uh, in this very handsome view uh, taken by the Boses about 1885. Next, please. And then we'll just look very quickly at a series of early 20th century postcards uh, that celebrate uh, the Lockwood cotton mills. Next, please. Next, please. And then this is uh, very late. This is a, uh, a Kodachrome uh, postcard mm -hmm. of the 50s, um, you know, not long uh, before the, the mills, of course, switch over to the, to the Hathaway shirt factories. Next, please. This is a series of interiors uh, taken by uh, Charles G. Crompton, um, probably uh, about uh, 1885. Uh, and unlike the Laroque views of, of Lewiston, nobody's home. <laughs> They're just empty interiors. Uh, and they don't even go to the point of specifying, uh, although certainly someone uh, knowledgeable about uh, the, the, uh, the textile industry would know what different rooms, what different manufacturing processes are going on. They don't even specify that in the captions. It's just mill interior, lockwood, cotton mills. Next, please. This is obviously spinning and weaving, spinning on the end. Next, please. Uh, this is a much later view uh, from 1899. Uh, it's labeled the Lockwood Mill, but to be honest with you, I'm a little doubtful. Um, this is, looks like a much smaller um, uh, textile operation. Uh, it might be in the Waterville area. As we know, of course, there was the Cascade Woolen Mill over in Oakland. There are a lot of smaller uh, textile mills uh, all up and down uh, central Maine. Um, this just has the feel of, of not being uh, the big Lockwood Mill interior, even though it's labeled as such. So we'll have to do some research on this one. Mm -hmm. Next, please. And this is a wonderful photograph. This is in the Lockwood Mills. Uh, this is printed from a glass plate negative of around 1900. Uh, this uh, very handsomely dressed young man uh, in his, um, uh, his tie uh, and his apron. Uh, very uh, proudly holding the spindle. Please. And then these are the wonderful uh, labor uh, photographs that have been discovered recently uh, by Gideon Pichet, who was active uh, as a photographer in Waterville from about 1894 to about 1902. Uh, and we're going to end with these. And I don't know, you might want to comment on these. I think what's so interesting about these um, and it's, there's a wonderful exhibit, and maybe I'll mention it, and, and Tanya can too, there's a wonderful exhibit over at Colby right now on a lot of these types of images from Gideon Pichet over in Special Collections that'll be up through the summer. Um, it certainly has a lot more of these kind of views, but these really strike me um, as intentional occupational portraits, um, holding up the tools of the trade with the scissors and the thread. It's a very, you don't, you look at it and you know that they are mill operatives of a certain era. And it's interesting to kind of um, trace how these images change by who um, peoples the mills. Um, and the type of, um, <laughs> some look annoyed that they're standing there on this. <laughs> Others look quite proud um, of the work that, that they're doing and that they're able to do. Um, and it's a skill. I mean, I think that that's important to mention about mill labor and not just textile mill labor, but paper mill labor and, and elsewhere. This is, this is skilled labor. It is um, cultivated and learned and taught. And there's a lot of pride, not only in the work itself, but what the people are producing and what the people are producing for the town and for their, for their livelihood, as, as there should be. Um, and you see that here and, and in many of them, which is why I think it's so important to always show the photographs of the exteriors and the interiors, but always people as well. I think there's one more really lovely one. Um, what year is this one from Earl? Uh, well, he was active uh, at, the, at this particular address, uh, 94 Water Street, from 1894 to 1902. And this one strikes me as even, even perhaps a little bit Later, there these um, they look more relaxed, like a little freer. Do you have this one? The back of the card says 1891. Okay, fantastic. Uh, the numbers on Water Street changed, but the house stayed the same. Ah, very good. <laughs> yeah, it's really um, 
I mean, you can see and just how many girls, and at various stages of their, their lives as well. And I think we have the most um, written stuff from the Lowell Mills because their women and young women were the most consciously active in producing um, a magazine that was sent really all over the world. They had subscribers in England. And it was only mill girls writing it and editing it. So people were very conscious of that literary work. A lot of it is stories, a lot of it's letters from the mills. And it's interesting because some of the women in the Lowell Mills who had edited and, and worked on this journal while working all went on to become writers. Um, and people have gone through and kind of traced back um, tried to find the women um, who wrote many of these stories, but in, in many cases it's difficult because many of them got married and changed their names and went back home after these brief stints in the working, um, the working world. Um, and so these group portraits, I think, are, are really striking. And we don't have as many of these kind of images from Massachusetts, whereas we have more text from there. So paired together, they kind of give us a richer understanding of their lives. And this is the final one, taken by Vos and Son in Waterville about 1890. Uh, and, and I just love the background of this one yeah. in his studio. <laughs> I think it's really lovely. And I also think the choice of, I think it's interesting to think about coming to a studio with the tools of your trade to be photographed in this way with the apron, um, with the tools that you'd be using, versus the photographer bringing the tools of his or her trade into the mill and doing that kind of work there, and the different kind of images you get from each one. So the photography, I think, is is very revealing in in that way, and take it together, they kind of help us understand um, really in a more richly. I can't. I'm trying not to use mill puns here. I was like, woven, tapestry, <laughs> fabric, fabric, um, the fabric of, of really what, um, of really what is, is going on, and and who was working, and, and how that changes. And I think I've been so, I'm at the very tail. I just finished my semester, and I've been grading and reading a lot, um, particularly for my main history class. And a lot of my students um, are the sons and daughters of who worked in these mills and work in them still. And it's really interesting to hear their reflections. I had one, um, uh, Gerard Perron, um, who was doing a project on uh, Franco Lewiston and kind of the cultural life of Franco Lewiston. This is a, oftentimes it starts as a personal exploration of a family history kind of writ large. And he would have this experience of looking on the main memory network for images um, of the mills and kind of cultural life of the mills. And lo and behold, he finds his uncle in a parade, <laughs> like as a baby, oh. up in this car. And he's looking at the name, he's like, that, wait, that's my uncle. <laughs> and so he's like reading about this in, the, in this paper. So I think it's this constant process of discovery and these family connections. And I think that's so much of your project, too, of, of these families that are, that are still here. And this is so much a part. And one thing that really struck me that he wrote about was that his grandfather came from Canada to work in the mill and make a better life, and his um, sons worked there. And then the, the, other, the next generation went on and became mechanical engineers. And then the next generation is in college and doing different things. And so the initial generations coming and making this and trying to make this better life and to have this solid work really made the kind of hopes and dreams of the next generation possible, which I think is such an important part of, of this work and the pride in this labor too that sometimes doesn't always come out in in the photos and, and the postcards in a way that, that it really needs to, which I think really does actually come out in the art on this wall in a very profound way. You know, I think if we if we look back at our own backgrounds, and it's certainly true in mine with both my grandfathers, uh, we are the children and the grandchildren of the Industrial Revolution. Thank you. Thank you.
we'll ask some questions and then we'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> then we're off. We'll we're 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 we're
is not only do you have these families coming in from uh, all over the globe, settling and following the work, as it were, but you also have a kind of, um, we have many sons and daughters who are the pride of the mills on the rivers and, and sort of look at us too, so it, it becomes both, and that's what makes it such an interesting, I think, dynamic within a community, um, is both the quote unquote, well, none of us are really native. Um, but in terms of we all came from somewhere at some point in time of who comes in when and how that works together in, in the mills. And so you do, in addition to having these people come down, you also do have um, local families and some farm families still move up into mill work as well um, this late. But I think more, more of these, especially in the much later 1890s, early 1900s ones, are more likely the families who are settling, and you can really see that. Because the, these are, um, whereas some of the early ones you really would say, well, these are girls, you know, and in some you would say these are children. I mean, I think you would say these are women and young, and young women. Young is tough, yes. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that certain tasks in the mill were gendered, is that right? Like, uh, obviously the administrators and the managers were men, but were they also sort of segmented off? Depended on the mill and the time period, too. I mean, when you have the Great Lowell experiment, yeah, I mean, also because there's the building of the mill and the maintenance of the mill and the machines, too. And so the digging of the canals around the areas, and uh, often both sort of gendered and ethnic, too, like especially in Massachusetts, a lot of the people who built the mills and dug the canals were Irish short of day laborers, oh, yes. um, which was true up into Lewiston as, as well, early on in the early mills. Um, whereas, yeah, so you had a lot of men as overseers, but that changes in the second stage of immigration, um, where then you get a lot of um, French Canadians coming down, and <coughs> Irish and Italians, and some, and some mills, Lebanese as well. And it's more about the pay of the job and less about the gender of the operative. And so as the kind of mill girl experiment dies out, women don't stop working in the mills by any means, but the notion of sort of recruiting wholesale these farm girls for this intermediary period really is replaced by immigrant labor up and down New England. In yeah, and, and just to, uh, from an architectural standpoint, with the touch on a very important thing, we know this very well from documentation, it is the <coughs> first wave of Irish who come into the Portland area in the late 1840s and the early 1850s, who then become um, immediately recruited to be the labor force who digs the canals and builds the mills in Lewiston between 1850 and 1860. That is almost entirely an Irish workforce. Well, thank you ever so much. Thank you. <laughs>
long-felt history of Maine was something that we could all relate to working in Fiverr. And um, it was interesting that the history program started in Bidford Saco because myself and another member who actually uh, Jennifer's work is here. She has another piece over there. Um, we kind of chaired up the committee and uh, they put a bit of research on that particular area and sort of made like open point to share the history and um, we covered everything from the landscape, why the mills were there, the river power, to uh, the brick mills, to the workforce, to child labor, to all the things that you've already heard about tonight, we compiled in very short bullet presentation and um, presented this concept of underlying threads, interpreting the textile history of a meal town to the group with it being wide open and how that was actually dealt with. Um, so it was really nice for me to come in um, almost three years later and see what people had actually created. I, I personally um, took more of a, a, a literal interpretation of this piece is uh, the story of a mill worker. I actually lived in Brunswick for 11 years and worked at the Jessica Historical Society for seven and um, had the opportunity to see a collection of nine square quilts that were utilitarian quilts made by a Cabot Mill workers of the family. They weren't fancy art pieces at all. They would keep her family warm. Um, and just hearing a little bit about that woman's history and knowing the history of Brunswick from my work experience, um, the French Canadian community had lived in a very small part of the town that was located next to the river in the cabinet mill. They were pretty self-sufficient in and of themselves. They were not welcomed in the community. They uh, were not. They, they, they stayed with themselves. They were marvelous people. They had wonderful celebrations. So this piece actually deals with how wonderful this woman was. Um, there's actually uh, one panel stitched of a night square and the words um, I am a daughter, a sister, a wife, a mother, um, the piece of kind of Mac, the buttons that create the letter A, her name was Alphonsine, um, actually were from her button collection, um, and the panel in the front in French it says do you know my name and it there's um, sort of a religious reference to the strong Catholic faith of French Canadian people in the community. And then the reverse side, um, the, there's a collage of words, textile words. There's actually a reproduction of a, a, a work ledger that was in the collection of the Historical Society um, stitched on one panel. And then the final panel is, I think they have these standards, so I can't to have some more luck. <laughs> uh, it's basically a ritual, sort of like a crochet, and it represents um, how this woman was pretty much shut in the middle to work and shut out of the town hall, which was also a brick structure. So again, very literal in my interpretations of the theme. Um, the, there's a piece in the other room that's a three part, it's called Brick and Mortar, and I'd probably say it better here than I can ramble on, it'll be quicker. Uh, the panels pay tribute to the machinery, mill worker, and water power that held together the textile industry and brick walls. And the panels are actually each stitched with a brick pattern with a sort of a cutout and sort of with a representation of each of those three things. Um, Scrupular, the work apron, um, is a, it's basically a contrast of material weights to reflect the emotional weight of the textile industry on the mill worker at the turn of the century. Um, again, that strong French-Canadian Catholic um, background. So that, that's probably my, my most conceptual piece. <laughs> and then the final one that I created actually was interesting. I started that piece um, when I lived in Brunswick and then I moved to Minot, which is just outside the Lewiston, Auburn area. And having a history interest, I began reading everything on the history of the Lewiston, Auburn area. 
and in addition to the textile mills that are there, the shoe industry was enormous. Um, so there are there's panels that have different patterns that are stitched to represent cloth. The textile industry are actually stretched over um, vintage shoe stretcher forms, which. The tops and the bottom are actually turned, wood turned pieces that are cut in half. Um, I, I, I actually own a wood turning mill, so the wood turning industry is near and dear to my heart and has just dissolved in the state of Maine at a very rapid rate, just as the textile in an in a earlier stage did. So um, there's a little bit of the shoe, and then um, what is the third industry? We've got shoe. Textile and wood churning. There's the three. <laughs> 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 and the 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 um, just, just to give you a little better idea of the design association I did, I just wanted to share this person I have carried away with myself, sorry. <laughs> the, uh, the vision for the national organization is to inspire creativity, encourage innovation, and advance and advocate for artistic excellence as the global leader in textile inspired art and design. They, there's a really lovely quarterly publication um, that's um, produced by the national organization that you receive as a member. And I'll leave these here with you in the gallery because um, I think they're I think they're really interesting. So um, that's my book to share. <laughs> and, and, and just be aware that the statements how all the artists are printed. You'll find them about the gallery. Um, and at least to share that many visitors have actually been picking this up and going and reading. Um, because it, it certainly will give you the mindset of what the artist was working with and creating the piece um, by, by reviewing that. Um, thank you. Um, and the panel in the front, in French, it says, do you know my for name? And if there's, um, so okay, you can <laughs> speak with her afterward. And the so now I'm going to introduce Priscilla Nicholson. So she's another one of our exhibiting artists. Side, um, deal, and there's so, a collage of um, words, textiles, work is on words, either side of this wall, and there's two pieces, the pieces in the bathroom. And We'll let Priscilla go from there. So over the mantle, and then panel, and then the panel is the pedestal right behind. Oh, okay. It's basically. I would much rather speak from behind everybody. I'm not going to do that. But I'll do my best. I don't know how many of you have gone around with the small barbs that we. Wrote up, but um, this piece over here, the in Sochi clothes, is the only piece that was really very directly related to mills and um, the history of mills within the surrounding communities. Um, but I thought that all the other pieces included still had a certain amount of connection and reference to the mill theme of the show. Um, obviously, when Jill, I took a very metaphorical approach to this, um, much more conceptual. Um, I see crochet as a complete metaphor for human interaction, connection, relationships, whether it's between women, families, couples, friends, along the broader social scene. And um, it also represents a domestic craft that has decades and decades of history actually all around the world. Um, as something that's very personal and something that probably a lot of these girls and women who are working in these mills learn from their own mothers and dads um, as a pastime or as something they would make that was both functional and decorative. I have taken both of those things out of my crochet. Um, on purpose. More 
to have the work represent a feeling or a concept, not as something that would actually be functional, um, as Lisa said, scarves, bags, um, doilies. How many of you have seen those crocheted doilies that women spend hours and hours affecting every little knot? Um, and the amount of variation in crochet knots around the world is really unbelievable. Um, I did not grow up doing a lot of handwork. I actually came from a family that had no artists in it. And my education was more um, liberal arts and studio arts, so the fine arts. Um, it wasn't until I uh, went with my husband and two sons to Australia between 2006 and 2010 um, that I actually began paying a lot more attention to textiles. Um, I found down there that there's such a plethora and diversity of immigrants, both European and Asian, who brought all of their handwork styles um, the mindset to the where we were living was Adelaide, so it's very much a, an old Australian kind of town. Um, that I found it really fascinating. And I was going through all kinds of thrift stores, because down there in thrift stores, you're getting authentic things. You're not getting you know, stuff from 1970. You're getting people who grandmother died, and you're getting the collection of what their grandmother aunts brought with them from Hungary, from um, England, um, and more recently people from the Middle East and all of their textile traditions, uh, Asia, um, and not really South America, but in general, it, it really was a very interesting experience. So I did two years of the design, uh, craft and textile design course for a certificate down there. Anyway, I had no idea how to do crochet. And I will say this, it took me a week to learn how to do single crochet. It was really humbling. I thought I was pretty adept at a lot of uh, art processes, but that was pretty humbling. So anyway, um, what I began to realize with the crochet was that with my formal background, I saw crochet as something um, a lot like relationships. You tie all kinds of knots over and over and over again, very time consuming, very patient, very meticulous. And then what happens to crochet? You pull the thread and everything unravels. <laughs> so I was looking, as I was looking through these thrift stores, I was finding bundles and bundles and bundles of old handwork and needlework and crocheted items, mostly crochet actually, um, that were selling for 50 cents selling for two dollars. Beautiful handmade tablecloths. I mean these things took months. It's unreal. And so to me there was a poignancy beyond the handwork. It was about the time and effort and creative energy involved in making something, investing in it, then to have it tossed away because it wasn't relevant anymore or it wasn't appreciated by the people who, who got it. And then that, what did that say? All of the effort had just simply disappeared. So I took that kind of idea and then started thinking, how can I make these kinds of um, thoughts or feelings um, more three-dimensional? Uh, I, when I started working with crochet, I found that I was using the cotton and I was trying to follow books, but I realized that 
I'm not very good at following patterns or counting. So um, it was immensely frustrating. And I realized I really didn't want to make a basket in, in the way that they were shown in books. So I decided I was just going to freelance. It was a lot more interesting to me. Um, and then if I made a mistake on the counting, it didn't matter. Uh, so I looked around. I looked around for all kinds of um, inspiration for someone who was doing this sort of work. I didn't find anything, actually. Uh, the closest thing I found was the Coral Reef Project. Anybody heard of that? Okay. I mean, that's pretty well known. And again, that's sort of free form in a different sense. But I, um, because wool is obviously hugely available and important down in Australia, I started working with wool um, because of the whole tactile feel of it. But I wanted something that created um, a sense of volume. So then I realized I could actually match it with fishing line and wire to make it actually become something that looked fragile, but was entirely resilient. Uh, so that's you know, the progression of, of how I started with this. And um, <coughs> I still like to use wool. Unfortunately, I've had experiences where um, my studio had moths. So I have actually lost a number of pieces because um, the moths got to them. Um, and I thought, all right, I will move on. I will not have to get to the end of wool crocheted items. Craft um, So that's partly why I don't use wool as much anymore. Anyway, um, but I discovered that jewelry wire, and um, I will say this. What I mostly use is 34 gauge to learn uh, wire. Do single and um, some of it is up to 42 gauge. And then what I try to do is either work with the wire alone or work with the thread with the wire um, to make subtle color changes. And um, they become very organic. So I don't know if any of you do crochet, but um, it's a bit like any sort of therapeutic uh, anxiety, you know, stress relieving sort of thing. Um, it's very meditative. Um, it can also be really um, mind numbing. So, uh, but it's you know, for me, I go into a different state. So a lot of things that are, you know, it's like yoga. Almost. Um, I do a lot of gardening, obviously, um, and it, just that whole tactile feel. That was one reason why I um, moved into textiles after I got my MFA in painting, um, because I got really tired of the paintbrush and simulating space. I did that for 20 years, and then I realized logistically with little children, that didn't work. And second, it's so much more fun. Textiles and whatever you're, you're doing with fabric or yarns or any kind of fiber. Um, plus, I can work small and put things together. So it's more portable. So I let's see. Do you have any questions? Obviously, this was not a prepared speech. Uh, I'm not a speaker. I do better working. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, let's see. This one probably is more geared toward, um, as I put in the uh, leaflet. Um, Vessels, I thought of an IV. I thought of uh, something that was nurturing, two different sides of it. Um, the vessels are symbolic of women. Um, I do a lot about women. So that some of these things weren't necessarily done for the mill, but they um, relate very significantly to 
women and women's lives. And um, uh, the closest thing I found the was the ups and downs, the challenges women have in their relationships, their families. And, um, and again, that's sort of free for through their lives. In so, so but I, um, at all. Anybody has any questions? No? Thank you. Thank you so much. 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 Thank the mills and, and well, I taught textile at Thomas College for 30 of my 41 so years there, and, and I took my students to Wyandotte, Cascade, mm -hmm. Hathaway, and my brother was one of. And I talked to my brother at some time. He was one of the top people at uh, Hathaway at one time. Oh, wow. So you took your students to the mill. That's very interesting. That must have been interesting to them. And that's what they remember about their education. It's wow. all those wonderful. A field trip, yeah. yeah. It's all about a field trip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will not have bits and bits of wool crochet. I think about learning it, but then when you're really so that's part yes. of the place so that you're learning. Totally uh, different story. Yeah. Well, I have to say, just being in the presence of this exhibit and this work, and partly from Kathleen Gadu's, um little history that she left about halfway. I, I didn't realize beforehand, I've lived in Waterville for 25 years, but that halfway was a part of this place for 160 years. I mean, that's just, that's a whole generations of people who had a whole different experience with this place than than I've had in that little bit of time, so, or know. you know, or people coming after. So it's just but, um, it's fascinating to me that 160 yeah. years—it's a long time. Uh, anxiety, so. you know. Anybody stress else? Kind of Anything they want to share? Um, time. So um, my name is Tanya. I teach at Colby, and I've been at Colby for two years. So I haven't lived in Waterville for very long, but um, it's really changed. Me. So, <laughs> I was born in Lowell, Massachusetts. I'm Franco-American. Um, All my grandparents worked in the mills. Like, mm -hmm. um, first generation college student. And, and I, lived in, I lived in Providence for a decade near the Slater wow. Mill. Wow. So it took coming to Waterville to, for me to really reconnect with my family history. I've been doing ancestry. I've been, oh, I did the exhibition at Colby and we, we worked with the Pichet family. So it's been something about Waterville <laughs> and the way you all are so connected to your history has really inspired and me to, to think about mine a lot more. Because my, my grandparents, and this may be the case for, for a lot of you, once they came to Lowell, they never went back to Canada. They never talked about Canada. They lived in the French ghetto in Lowell, but we weren't going back. So it, it, we weren't really supposed to talk about it. It was just, you know, move forward, move forward. So my grandparents didn't want to talk about where they were from. But yeah. Now I want to talk about all this. Providence and Lowell. Yeah, and about a lot of ethnicities, yeah, I mean, French, I, Italian, uh, Armenian, and we were just talking about that. But our, our families wanted to assimilate so much. You know, they didn't want us to speak the language. They wanted us to speak English. And how that was so important to that generation. But to us now, we're trying to like go backwards and grasp all we can of what we have, what, what, what is our ethnicity, and learn about our families. Yeah, this is inspiring for me too because you guys are mentioning that Maine, many mills in Maine and the Northeast were dependent on the cotton mm -hmm. business in the South. Um, and I'm from Atlanta. Um, and my, I think my great great grandfather worked, I believe, in a cotton mill. But you know, this conversation makes me want to figure it out more and learn more, like you're saying. Um, but the one story that I can remember that my dad has told me is they tried to integrate um, blacks into that mill that my grandfather, my great great grandfather was working in and obviously there was this huge strike at the time um, and was going to be separated and um, so all the white mill workers 
were on strike and didn't want to work and they were going to be integrated. And my great great grandfather just wanted to work and he was like, he's <laughs> <laughs> and so he went to work and he broke the strike and so they lynched him. No, no, not lynched him. Sorry, they tried to feather him. That's wrong. They, they did like this crazy. Oh, it was really bad. Oh, it was really bad. Really bad. Sorry, I, sorry. I, I know. I know. I started it. I way dramatized it. <laughs> idea of like, I, you know, I want to learn more about that. I want to know what that moment was like and understand more about the mill. <laughs> There's a really great show on the stage for a couple more days um, called Paper Maker. It's Monica Woods um, who wrote when we were the Kennedys um, and writing about it's paper mills, but it's uh, it would help you connect with the strike breaking thing. I think yeah. it's an unbelievable show about sort of family and mill work and generational work. And this is a, it's an Irish Catholic um, story. It's really, really worth seeing. I think it's through May 21st, so there's another 10 days. It's down at Portland Stage. Um, worth the trip. Yeah. It really is a great story. One of my colleagues, Marie Dean, was, she's part of the Lebanese community, and her uh, parents came here to work in the cotton mills. Mm -hmm. And her sister never came over here. They sent money back to that country. So I learned a lot from her based on the, her history. It's also interesting, um, all, all of the industries that came about because of the, the, the brick the brick mills, to mint the bricks, yeah. to, to you know, I mean, absolutely. Wow. It, it just spans out, and that, you know, it's partially why it becomes such a loss to the community to mm -hmm. lose any one piece of that because it's all the, the peripheral things mm -hmm. that support that also no mm -hmm. longer have a purpose in the area. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, a lot further reaching. But everything has a cycle and I truly believe that we will see the day when these mills have life again. We have to start making things. <laughs> we make things. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I'm hopeful. Yeah. Do you know anything about the Mayo Mills in Dover Fox Trump? That's my hometown, and that's going to be a mixed use facility now? Yes, yes. Well, of course, those are right along the river, right, right, right mm -hmm. in the downtown. Uh, and uh, you're right, that's, that's been a, a really highly successful, what we would call an adaptive reuse project. And there's a combination, it's quite a span of of history to those mills. Um, they started uh, before the Civil War, and there are still some of the very simple wooden structures that were that were built at that time. But then there are also uh, buildings as late as from around 1910, when they were using the very, at that time, very modern um, steel and concrete and brick construction for mills. Um, and you're right, it's multiple, multiple use. It's, it's housing, it's small industries, it's commercial activities. It's, it's very exciting. And, and actually, um, from the historic preservation standpoint, we're seeing uh, adaptive reuse of these mill complexes all over the state now. A lot of it is being encouraged by the federal and state tax credit programs. Uh, the buildings become eligible for the National Register, and then if they're eligible, then developers often come in and rehab them and find new uses for them. Um, a lot of the mills in Biddeford and in Lewiston have been adapted for housing, for example. Yeah. And in Westbrook, yeah, a lot of it has been adapted for artist space yes. and, dance, yes. and dance studio, which is kind of interesting, like <laughs> yeah. large dance studio space because yes. of the wooden floors and the wide yeah. and a huge um, in the Data Ward Mill um, in Westbrook, there's a huge photography collective too, the Bakery Photography Collective. Yeah. So it's been really, that adaptive reuse has been really interesting yeah. to kind of watch unfold and give new life to the spaces. When I was up in the cab, my dad's little museum was on Hathaway, down in the Hathaway Creative Center. Well, this yes. year, there's a model for that in Lewis and Arbor. Lewis and Arbor has a museum in LA. There's a great model for that too, I totally agree. Yeah. They've got photos all around the building. Well, Remy and I lived in here, which is uh, where we're in his parents. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, but they have photos. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
anybody wants to know that that is. <laughs> 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 well, that's really so that was in Dover Foxcroft that your brother was? No, he was, was a happy player. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. He's always worked in the government industry. Mm -hmm. So that's just part of your family. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, he went to work for the parent company in Tennessee, Murfreesboro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, it all, wherever, wherever he went, it, it was defunct after mm -hmm. a while. And then he went to this $20 million plant in Florida, making the Tony Bama type shirts. Mm -hmm. And then the economy bottomed out, and no one wanted to buy that type mm -hmm. of garment. So it's been tough. It was it was a sad and actually very prolonged demise of the American textile industry. It seemed yeah. to begin after World War II and heighten in the 50s and 60s. When I was a child, as I mentioned early on, I was born and brought up in Portland, but we, we had 15 summers from 1955 to 1970 in Skowhegan. Mm -hmm. Skowhegan had, you know, the American Woolen Company, a big, big mill, very active. The people whom we rented our cottage from, uh, Paul Stewart, um, was a very highly skilled textile designer for the American Woolen Company. And they had, actually I think they had two uh, big factories in Skowhegan. And yet by around uh, 1960, um, those factories had been bought out and closed and the equipment sent down south. Yeah. And a lot of that was was engineered by a financier from Boston named Bernard Goldfein. And he, he um, literally went into the New England mill towns, bought out the mills, and dismantled them, and, mm. and sent the equipment south. Uh, and so Mr. Stewart had to go down to um, Andover, uh, to this J.P. Stevens company. And he worked there for the rest of his life. He felt so fortunate to get a job in his industry, because many people were, were just lost to the industry. Mm -hmm. Well, interesting that the whole textile design in in an in industrial setting was, I think, some of the early parts of surface design. Um, mm -hmm. And now that's evolved as well. But um, I first learned of the Surface Design Association when I moved to Maine to work at Forster Manufacturing in Wilton, which was um, not textiles, but um, wood, wood manufacturing of toothpicks, clothespins, um, wooden croquet sets, and um, so just huge, huge manufacturing, huge, huge industry, so. Well, I think that picks up on the point that Libby made, which is that, you know, the, the complexity of the workforce, mm. even with one mill, I mean, you did have a large number of operatives, but then you also had this sort of pyramidal hierarchy, mm -hmm. which included people who were involved in the design. Yes. And oftentimes these people were relatively well paid, very skilled. Yes. Um, a, a fair number of the of the designers actually came from from the factories in England. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. About the uh, mills in Guildford and. Uh, Basil Grove, I think, is an earlier era. It is, it is. It's very, it, well, what we forget is that although we dealt tonight with these big complexes, uh, the cotton and woolen industry, and more the woolen industry, I think, mm -hmm. operated in the smaller oh, uh, settings yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and was everywhere all yeah. through central Maine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The East Grand Grand too, right? Yeah. The yeah. Mail, right? Yes. 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 Gorham made oil cloth up for us. Special floor kind rug, like paint. My my brother and sister worked in the Guilford Mill in the summers. I never did that. Wasn't that, wasn't that woolen? Uh, yes, yes. yes. Well, it, it, it was a change to. Yeah, there was actually a whole spring of woolen mills in central Maine. There are some very interesting books that were published in the early 20th century. Uh, there was a sort of American Woolen Association that the mills owned to, and they uh, belonged to it. And they published uh, sort of like an annual with a picture of each mill and a little bit of data about it. It's very interesting documentation. Wow. In, the, in Biddeford, I the, that horrible, it still exists, but it's made down south now. I, but the process was invented, the Velox blanket. So, yes. Um, oh. it, there's horrible things. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but the centers of the um, triptych that with the brick on the outside that's in the other room that I created, the backgrounds are actually felt blanket <laughs> material. <laughs> I know that they felt in Camden too. Yes. Yeah. The Knox the Knox mill. Wow. Well, thank you all so, so much for joining us and sharing thank this you. story. Thank you. It was a fun night with lots of different moments. Yes. And, um, I wanted to say threads. Lots of different threads. Thank you so much. We just appreciate this, and this is so interesting yeah, to very interesting. weave this all together. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard not to. It's hard it's not to. Easy. It's yeah. easy. Hard not to. Enjoy your night. Yeah.